Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce Mark Bittman tonight. He is the author of 20 acclaimed books, including the How to Cook Everything series, the award-winning Food Matters, and the New York Times number one bestseller, VB6, Eat Vegan Before Six O'Clock. For more than two decades, his popular and compelling stories appeared in the Times, where he was ultimately the lead food writer for the Sunday Magazine and became the country's first food-focused op-ed columnist for a major news publication. He starred in four television series, including Showtime's Emmy-winning Years of Living Dangerously. He has written for, for nearly every major newspaper in the United States and many magazines, and has spoken at dozens of universities and conferences. His 2007 TED Talk has more than a million views. In 2015, he was a distinguished fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. He is currently a fellow at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Throughout his career, Bittman has strived for the same goal, to make the food, in all its aspects, understandable. This evening, he'll be joined in conversation with Rick Nichols, former longtime food columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer and professor of food writing at the University of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mart Bedman and Rick Nichols. I just wanted to start right out saying that I was, I was among the many people shocked and stunned to read your farewell column in the Opinionator in the uh, New York Times about a year, only a year ago, or just, just over. Just a year ago. Just a year ago. Uh, to, to head off uh, for unnamed at that point, greener or maybe purpler uh, pastures. Um, and one of your laments was that, quote, food writing had changed since you had joined the Times and especially even in the five years that you'd been an opinion writer. And I was wondering what had changed, I take it not for the better because you were leaving, well, uh, you know, actually not, <coughs> not for the, not really for the worse. When I started food writing, I, I mean, I imagine we started at the same time when I started food writing, really 1980 or so, there weren't that many of us. And there was no internet. Um, it was all so on. you either wrote for newspapers or magazines or you didn't yeah. write at all. Um, I don't know, when I was young and hungry, I suppose, and I, I was, I was just telling this former student yesterday that there was a time when I had seven deadlines a week. I mean, I had four deadlines for the New Haven Register and I had three de deadlines for the Fairfield Citizen News. So um, that was tough. And, um, and then I started writing for the Times and started writing cookbooks and things got easier and they felt more important in a way. I had a larger reach. And then I started writing the opinion column. When I started writing the opinion column, which was only five years ago, 2011, I started writing serious food pieces in 2007, 2008, and um, there weren't that many people doing that. By the time I stopped, I felt like there were, where there had been, say, five or 10 people, there were 50 or 100 people, many of whom were doing a better job than I was. Ooh, because they didn't have as much, they had more to prove than I did. And I think... Yeah, maybe they didn't uh, have their cup running over as uh, Well, as there was that did. too. I was yeah. busy. But I, I also think that, you know, after 30 years, literally, there was a break in there somewhere, but after 30 years of weekly, twice weekly, whatever it was, deadlines, I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't take any more lying awake at night trying to figure out what I was going to write and did I do a good enough job and da 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 and then have it start all over again. And... Um, when I joined the Purple Carrot, which I've since left, as most of you probably know, it didn't last very long. Don't steal my third question. Okay, well, okay. I won't. <laughs> well, you, just, you want me to stop and then no, you can no, ask me? When I joined the Purple Don't Carrot, I thought, down. well, I, this is a cool thing to do, but I think this is probably about more about leaving the times than about going someplace else. And that's, um, well, that's I, how it turned out. I, I needed to leave, you know, and yeah, there's no right. hard feelings. It's I love the institution. I've written a couple pieces since. Um, it just was time. Yeah, but I, that's, that's what I wanted to ask is, you know, you've, 
you can feel exhausted, you can feel, uh, you know, you've sort of done it all, you can feel like, you know, the barbarians are at the gates, you know, and writing, like, blogging their brains out. I think a couple of years ago, I, I tallied up the number of um, food bloggers in Philadelphia, it was over 100. Mm. <laughs> In Philadelphia, and when I started writing in you the Empire Mags, I was it. I was yeah. the man. Um, so you know, I was trying to figure out a way to like cyber attack those. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but I was just curious. You know, sometimes there comes a point. You know, you're lying awake, you're doing this, but you're you're slogging along. Was there a tipping point? Was there something like a story that you were ashamed of, or that you were weren't proud of, or was there somebody leaning on you to do something different? And you said, "I've had it." I can answer that question, yeah, I, I, but I want to be a little more clear. I didn't feel like um, uh, I had said all I had to say. I felt like I had said all I had to say within the constraints of my deal with the Times. Oh. Um, and my deal with the Times was I was an, an, an opinion writer, but I was the food guy. So, you know, I could stray a little bit, but I was the food guy. And I felt like the if there was a tipping point, it was when I felt obligated for the, um, I don't know, probably fifth or sixth time in five years to write about GMOs, which I don't think are that big an issue. But so many people do that I was sort of forced to oh, write it again. And I felt like what I wrote was pretty much the same thing I'd written five years earlier. And I felt like, yeah, if I'm just gonna, if I'm narrowed, if I'm constrained, in writing about food and then I'm further constrained in writing to make sure that people understand the most fundamental issues, mm -hmm. I had kind of said it in that world. I had mm -hmm. kind of said what I mm -hmm. had to say. In, the, in, the, in those boundaries. <coughs> well, in that column you also talked about these sort of intractable food issues or ones either intractable or that weren't getting sufficient attention or weren't you weren't able to move the needle. And one was fairer treatment for uh, food workers, I guess, b both in the fields and in the kitchens, and not just animals, right. not just animals. Um, and uh, um, the uh, kids, getting kids hooked on soda, making soda more available, sugary drinks more available to, to children that is, and is healthy. Uh, and another was uh, antibiotics uh, in, in our meats and, and so forth that we're going to come back to haunt us as we have started starting to see. I was wondering, I mean, just I know it's only been a year or so, but on those kinds of issues, have you noticed any retrenchment or uh, pr progress? Do you feel like we're kind of inching along or we're just abandoning the field? I don't know. What, how well, you know, I just remembered that I've written three op-ed pieces since I left, and one was on the Philly soda tax. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Thank you, Mayor Kenny. I didn't come down for that, but I made a bunch of phone calls and um, did what I could. I thought it was important. That it's known that I thought that, that was important. And, and so there has been some progress on that, Berkeley and, and now Philly. Um, you know, in that piece I wrote that, that everybody thinks, you know, people will say things like, oh, Berkeley, well, Berkeley's weird. Um, but Berkeley was like the first city in the country to desegregate its schools. It was the first city in the country to put in ramps on sidewalks for wheelchairs. It's the first city in the country to do mandatory recycling. So all of these things that Weird Berkeley does, everybody else does now. So the fact that Weird Berkeley and staunch blue collar working class Philly are now both doing um, soda taxes, that's progress. I think it's really cool. I think we'll see some more action on that this fall and um, or next month. And I think it's That'd Oakland, great, Oakland being, and San Francisco you know, the, the, and a couple the, other places. The soda makers are suing the, the, the city, we'll, you know, as happens. Yeah, but they're dead. We'll, they're just we'll, 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 see. <laughs> we'll see. You heard it here first. Yeah. Um, um, and then, you know, I, I, I wrote that column at the, at the very beginning. You're referring to the sort of wrap-up column I wrote, but the wrap-up column I wrote was not, this la not unlike the first column I wrote. In the first column I wrote, I said it's time that people who claim to care about food, care about workers as well as animals. This is really ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I think, not taking any credit, but I think we've seen that change start to happen. So there's progress, but you know, you can't make much progress in food without making progress in many other arenas um, of society. And um, I don't know, we've, 
there's a lot of work to be well, done. And that, that leads to my next question. Which is about <coughs> baking. <laughs> Which what? <laughs> it's about <laughs> baking. <laughs> oh, actually, that's later. I have a bacon, not a bacon question, but a, a bacon reference. Salted in here for bacon lovers, vegans, hold your ears. But, um, <laughs> but an, another major stall or, or intractable problem is climate change, which has profound in influence on crops, um, on um, uh, fisheries, et cetera, it's, uh, something that you're very interested in. I just read a, um, a poll today somewhere, and it said that <coughs> people who think that uh, human activity is responsible for problems with our climate and, and, and so forth, it broke down to something like 72% of Democrats believe that and like 24% of Republicans believe that, which is a huge gulf. Do you see any way or any strategy that we're, we're that political um, distance could be somehow shrunken? I don't know if that was well, that. Well, you know, a majority of Americans believe in angels, so. You, know, you don't believe in angels? <laughs> what has the podcast? I believe in angel investors. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, right. You know, I think we have to. I think we have to take a hard look at what our school systems are doing and how how defunded education has been in the last 30, 35 years. Um, and we have to think about teaching rigorous thought. We have to think about teaching logic and dare I say it, rationality. We have to understand the role of science. And you know, so science, unlike religion, is not something you believe in. Science is something that questions and evaluates. And um, the results are always being questioned and reevaluated. And right now, you have 99% you know, of climate experts <coughs> saying climate change is um, caused by human activity. So whether people believe in it or not is not really the issue. The issue is it's real. So before we move on beyond the purple carrot, mm. and now do people know what the per it doesn't? Let's skip this part. It's not. Well, that no, no. I, I, it, it, it's, it was <laughs> vegan meal kits, you know, ready to make meals. Like, has anybody heard of Blue Apron? It's one. Of, it, it's similar to that, but it's uh, vegan oriented. Um, but uh, w did, w without getting into uncomfortable territory. Where, um, where was it, was it the concept that you so, sort of parted ways with, or the the business, or you just or were you just busy, busy doing other stuff? No, it was. Um, I think I was just impatient, and mm -hmm. um, the concept was great. Uh, maybe I was unrealistic about what could be achieved in what amount of time, or maybe my partners didn't quite understand how serious I was about achieving it. But in any case. Uh, more interesting things were available to me, so I left. It's not. It's really not worth talking about. Well, we're not not gonna, that interesting. We're going to just drop the purple carrot part <laughs> of this. Thing. I had like seven more questions about the purple carrot. <laughs> we'll move right along. Um, so I think one of your last visits to the library here, uh, you were talking about I don't know if you had just done the book or you were thinking of doing a book um, on vegan before six. I think the last time I was here, we were flogging fast, how to cook everything fast. Oh, really? Which was, because well, that was two years ago. I didn't think the last time. VB6 six was, 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 was probably three or four years before that. Okay. So, but yeah. Did I say the last time? I meant one, one of the times. Okay, yeah. One of the times. <laughs> can they audit these tapes? Can they edit these <laughs> tapes or these uh, podcasts or whatever? Uh, Whatever. Um, <laughs> all I wanted to ask about that, which is a very interesting concept, and you've done did a book on it, which got a a, a big um, reception, big positive reception. Mm -hmm. um, f first of all, I think for 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 s some of the folks, maybe just describe what that what that I I is. Then uh, the second thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, have you been able to Stick with that, or do you, uh, you find it still a, a functioning, a functional dietary regimen? Well, so VB6 is this way I started eating in 2007, where I eat 
like a very strict vegan, only plant foods, no processed foods, no white flour, no blah, 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 until 6 o'clock, and then I do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> and it worked, and it, and it works. And I st yes, I still do it. I don't do it quite as religiously as I did then, but I still do it. It works. Um, it's a discipline, and the discipline is, you know, people, people s ask, what, sh what should I do about diet? And, and I can go into this later if you want me to. But um, uh, I think there's really two rules about eating. One is you have to define what food is because a lot of stuff that's sold out there that's labeled food is actually not food. Um, so you personally can make some kind of decision or I'm happy to make it for you. But um, <laughs> You decide what food is and you leave everything else behind for the most part. And then the second rule is you eat more from the vegetable kingdom than you did the plant kingdom than you did last week, last month, last year. And you continue. And those, if you do those two rules, you have a sound, healthy diet. Everything else is, every other question is secondary to those two. Okay, I've, I've got a gotcha question now. So what did you have for lunch today? Um, I stopped at a supermarket because this is sometimes what you have to do and had little baby carrots and a little tub of hummus and um, a cucumber and a couple apples. So it wasn't that exciting, I have to say. So I didn't get you. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what, but you, you, that would not be an uncommon Well, on the road, you either sort of give up or you just get, you, know. you just, to act like you're a fanatic. You, 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 have you heard? You, <laughs> I, I give up and sometimes go through the fast food yeah, window. That's yeah. probably the only time I really do eat the fast foods when we're on a long uh, trip. But so do you know the Zahav? You know the Zahav folks here in Philadelphia, right? Yeah. Um, if you ever have a chance and are staying more than twelve hours, they have a little place called a humasia called Dizengoff. I don't know whether you've been there or not, but it is the world's finest tahina with um, uh, a lot of tahina in, in, the, in, in the hummus. And um, they just opened up a, a, a small branch at, um, on, I think, Chel in Chelsea Market. Oh, great. So you well, can go, go to that one. in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to help. Just trying to help out here. <laughs> All right. So let's talk baking because if you came in that door, you probably saw the compendium um, that uh, Mark has put together at se almost 700 uh, pages. And I think I was mentioning to you just before we came on that Chris Kimball of uh, America's uh, uh, Test Kitchen fame um, had a, a similar break that Mark had a year ago about he, he's unsatisfied with, with his position, has left America's uh, test kitchen and for new uh, ventures. Anyway, that's only to say that one, one of the things he said in an interview that I, I read earlier today was, um, I don't think I have anything left to add about how to make an oatmeal cookie. Good. <laughs> so He does it. But, but <laughs> You know, this gentleman worked with Mr. Kimball back in the day. How long ago was that? That was way back. That's when they were just starting the Cook's Illustrated. 30 right? years. 30 years. No, well, we worked together at Cook's Magazine before Cook, Cook's, Cook's Illustrated. Was, it was just Cook's 87. Magazine. And, uh, I mean, you... We're like twins. We're very good friends, I actually. Know. You helped launch... Well, you helped launch... You helped reanimate that Cook's into a multi-million dollar empire. That's why I don't have to work. Chris, yeah. <laughs> why are you working then? But um, anyway, so you've chosen uh, not just uh, to tell people how to bake or to bake an oatmeal cookie, but basically to bake everything. Well, or a little plug enough. for the book. That's yeah. the book's name. Yeah. But uh, no. But what I'm saying is, here's a guy who said, I, "I've had it. I'm, I can't write another thing about." It. And but you have cho you grabbed onto that that task with, 
I would assume, renewed energy. Well, you know, the funny and thing is that Chris and I, this is, it's actually an interesting question because Chris and I, when we parted ways, which was about 94, 95, we had a variety of differences. They were all professional. We really do love each other. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was that our, I was really the editor of Cook's Illustrated and I wanted to do things my way and he was really the owner and publisher of Cook's Illustrated, so he was my boss. And we had very different takes on things and Chris always felt like his job was to find out how to make the best oatmeal cookie. Like, yeah. there's some holy grail of oatmeal cookies. I'm gonna make that. And I always felt like, that's just silly. Just make an oatmeal cookie and then you can make it 20 different ways and you'll like whichever ones you like because my best oatmeal cookie is not your best oatmeal cookie. So is it in a, it's not profound, but in a very real way, we had a fundamental difference in our approach to cooking. And he went on and, you know, built this empire company's worth a couple hundred million dollars at this point, I think, or, or more, and, and the empire was based on a test kitchen that would say, we're going to define meatloaf, there's no reason to make it any other way, and I went on to do this series of books, not only How to Cook Everything, but my other books are similar, in which I say, well, here's how you make it, it's sort of the simplest, best, most straightforward way, and here's five or ten or twenty different ways you can spin it and you only need to learn that basic way in order to figure out the other ways, know the other ways. And you know, I'm, not, I'm not attacking Chris's way of doing things or defending mine, but I can't do a small cookbook because I can't say, here's a hundred cookie recipes and then just do a hundred cookie recipes because really there's not, there aren't that many differences among cookie recipes. Makes much more sense to do 30 cookie recipes, each with five variations on average. So that's what baking is. It's really very much in the tradition of How to Cook Everything. All of the now five How to Cook Everything books are, are like that. The first one was. And, but if you look at my first book, which was called Fish, um, still in print, I'm proud to say, um, fish was the same thing. It was like if you have a white fleshed filet, Here's what you ought to do with it. Well, it wasn't I, like cod with cilantro, lime, and uh -huh. chilies, and then two pages later, haddock with cilantro, lime, and chilies. <laughs> <laughs> There's books like that. It, we it, all know it's that. Sort of like, yeah, the, the mystery's already been solved. Right. I, I actually, a, a, a personal note here, that your recipe for cooking simple fish dishes uh, in the minimalist, uh, there's a salmon recipe in there that is so fundamental, it changed my life. I was always afraid to cook salmon, and your recipe is, uh, to quote Chris Kimball's language, bulletproof, hmm. bulletproof. And glad to hear it. I bet I could screw it up, but no, I'm glad you to couldn't hear it. screw it up. <laughs> it's 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 uh, flesh side down. In, in a saute pan and a little bit of peanut oil for about a minute or two. Flip it back over, so flesh side up, skin down, into the oven, 500 degrees, six minutes. Done. Every time. Doesn't matter how thick it is, it just works. <laughs> it's a genius. You're very flexible. Let's hear it for the Thank genius. You. Right. <laughs> Man is a genius. It's the only recipe I've ever used of his that worked. <laughs> What can I say? But so anyway, that, that leads me to a question. Uh, with, you know, I'm a big fan of the, he had a column, obviously, called The Minimalist uh, in, the, in the Times, a uh, weekly uh, column that was, had, a, had a huge following, and then that led to the books, collections. What, ha what changed in your hormonal uh, aspect that, where you went from being a, a, a minimalist to a maximalist with these, you know, uh, uh, encyclopedic books. I mean, was there was there some was it a midlife? Uh, They're actually the same thing. They really are. Uh, They're, the minimalist grew out of a philosophy that you should be able to look in your refrigerator, in your pantry, come back from <coughs> the store and look in your shopping bag and make dinner from what you had. Instead of starting with a recipe, you should start with what food it is that you have. 
both the books and the column had that philosophy. I've always thought that. That also goes back to Fish and even to my work at the esteemed New Haven Register. Um, it's just that the books are really big. But, you know, I was doing a weekly column that seemed that was work, but each thing was sort of representative of a bigger picture I was trying to paint, I think. Let's just talk for, for a moment um, about the, the life and times of baking itself. Um, as we all know, in the 70s, red meat got a really bad rap uh, for cholesterol and, and so forth, the Surgeon General's report. Um, we find out now that uh, Harvard scientists were being paid by the sugar lobby to kind of bolster sugar's reputation right. to the disadvantage of the meat folks. Um, and, but then the pendulum swung and in, what is it, 2004 or so? Yeah, 2004, I went and, and looked up, bakery after bakery after bakery was closing because of the low carb fad. Right. And um, now that's industrial baking. Um, but then also I think at home, you know, pastas, breads, and so forth, where people were really cutting down uh, a lot on that. So uh, did, did, you, did you figure that there was some thin ice that you might be treading on to go out and, and you know, wave the banner of, of home baking? Or uh, did you detect the fact that, you know, baking an apple pie and, and making cookies and interesting pancakes really was baked, was, was part of people's DNA and that was immune to some of these trends of, I, I don't know, if that, is that a good well, question? Well, I'm not writing for question? trends or I'd be writing a gluten-free cookbook. Um, <coughs> no, I didn't mean, well, so I, I meant major trends. I think trend. the answer I mean, is it, that it, baking, baking, both savory and sweet, the book covers both, true. has yeah. an honorable and <coughs> interesting tradition. I don't think it's in our DNA, but I think it's in our in our history and we like it. These are not, I mean, I think probably a third of the recipes in the book are savory and have no sugar. The other two thirds candidly have sugar and or white flour. They're not, they're not low sugar recipes. When there's sugar in them, there's the right amount of sugar in them, which often means, you know, more than you would want to eat at every meal. But, you know, I'd rather have a small piece of a good dessert than the kind of stuff a lot of people eat at breakfast every morning. So, um, you know, I think baking's fun. Baking's communal. Baking is interesting. I'm talking about talking about sweet baking is a thing that we do for celebrations. It's a thing that we do to, for gifts. It's a thing that we like to do together and to teach our kids and to do with our kids. And you know, the other side, savory baking is just a form of cooking. And I'm I'm a Mm -hmm. Bread been baking bread for forty years, forty five years yeah, now. The, actually, the, the no, need, like no need bread, bread right? Yeah. Is there the famous so, uh, five thousand million hits on that one, right? My so wife makes it. She makes it. Good. No need bread. Look it up. Cook it. Don't need it. Um, I, I can't find my notes, but the, but it was funny on you know almost on one of the days that some of your ads were starting to to run for the baking book. There was a, a strip in the Times just the other day on a, a book called Celebrations, and its and its little subhead was against all grain, uh, gluten. Uh, what's another grain problem? Uh, I, I forget, but anything with with grain in it was like, and it, it was a big ad. For, do you know what I'm talking about? What was her name? Uh, Danielle, I, somebody. I don't, um, yeah. and I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I. If you're interested, I'm interested. I'm but, not interested. Um, it's just another gotcha question. But um, <laughs> as I said, I'm not. I'm not writing for yeah. trends. I'm not. You know, I think there are obviously people who are allergic to gluten. Mm -hmm. People are allergic to many things. It doesn't mean the rest of us should suddenly decide that they're evil and stop eating them. So, you know, people are allergic to peanuts. There will come a time when everybody stops eating peanuts for a while. I'm sure, but we'll recover from that also. Well, it, it, it's interesting. Mark Vetri, who's a, a, a chef in, in Philadelphia, is a big 
anti-gluten-free crusader. He thinks, you know, they, obviously, there's the people with celiac disease, it's a real, real problem. And he's, but he thinks that it's, it's become a, such a marketing thing that a lot of people don't quite understand. And you'll see things now like gluten-free potato chips. We saw gluten-free water. <laughs> but, you know, potatoes don't have gluten, by the way, or most water that I know of. But my favorite, th my favorite sign was at an Amish stand, the Byler's Bakery in the Reading Terminal Market the other day, obviously trying to get on the bandwagon, but not quite getting it right. It said, glutton-free donuts. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, isn't that an oxymoron? Glutton-free donuts? You're, you're, you're a glutton by definition going after those things. And I'm gonna, I'm, I, I just got the high sign, and I'm going to sign off. Uh, uh, we're we're going to take some questions. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I have already dog-eared my copy of uh, uh, ba uh, everything about uh, ba baking everything uh, on the on the uh, on the pancakes uh, thing, where it says you can make pancakes substituting orange juice for the dairy, and another recipe where you take the batter and you pour it over already cooked bacon, and I thank you and my grandchildren are going to love you forever when I make these pancakes with orange juice and bacon. A full meal. Any Hi. Hi. Oh, lots of loud, okay. Um, my name's Byrne, I'm from Penn. Um, I was one of Rick's students a few years ago. Hi, Byrne. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here with a bunch of people from Penn Appetit, which is our food magazine. Um, and I spent my summer recipe testing for a cookbook, so I was wondering what your recipe testing process is like and how many times you usually make your recipes before you go forth with them. I mean, I'd be curious to hear what yours is like, but I guess that's an offline conversation. Mine has always been like, if you don't have something right on the second try, something really is going wrong. Um, so usually it's once, sometimes it's two or three times, but it's not more than that. Um, but you know, I'll tell you a story. There's this thing, there's this thing called um, Cook the Book, and it's an online index of, some of you obviously know, but for those of you who don't, it's an online index of cookbooks. So if you say, I want eggplant mar parmesan, I have all of Mark Bittman's books, what book is this in? Cook the Book will tell you. So the Cook the Book person, whose name is uh, escaping me at the moment, emails me and says, we have 24,000 of your recipes catalog. Good God. I, someone asked me yesterday, how many recipes have you done? And I said, I don't know, 12 or 15,000. So this woman says, 24, like 24,783 recipes. So the story is 1985 or so, 82. I was restaurant reviewer for Connecticut Magazine, and I was trying to cook with as many different people as I could, um, which, by the way, is good practice for everybody, I think, because both the teacher and the student learn um, cooking with other people is great. So I go and I cook with this guy named Jean-Louis Girin, who was running, at the time, the best restaurant in Connecticut. And um, I said to him, so when you have an idea for a recipe, you like go to the stove and you start taking things out. And he said, no, I don't go to the stove when I start taking things out. I have an idea for a recipe. I think this is how I'm going to cook it. And then I go cook it. And it is sort of like that. I mean, baking, it's a little trickier. Are you using three teaspoons of baking powder or using, you know, five or whatever? But for the most part, the ratios of things when you've cooked a lot are just, they're in there. And the flavor combinations are in there. And the timing is in there. And you can do it by looking. So the testing is just to confirm, in most instances, what you already know, right? Um. My question is kind of piggybacking on that one. Is there anything in the book that you found really, really difficult or that took you a lot of time, or is there anything that didn't make the book because you just like couldn't figure it out? Well, there were some things that went wrong, and I conveniently don't remember them, but we <laughs> did throw them out. And, and as I said, if you can't get something right on two or three tries. Um, the other thing is that my cooking is simple. It always has been. I don't like complicated stuff. But I will also say, as someone who's made bread for, as I said, 45 years, I don't have it right. So um, the recipes are, I mean, the brownie recipe, for example, whatever, is fine. It's perfect. It's not going to go wrong. 
but some things, bread most notably, are different every day, and um, they're so simple. I mean, there's only three ingredients in bread, flour, yeast, and salt. So, um, well, four. Um, <laughs> so you're highly dependent on each of those ingredients, and if you're mixing flours, then you're dependent on the ratio, but the weather changes things. If you use brownies, uh, you know, making brownies, obviously you can make them better or worse, but when you have strong flavors like chocolate and butter and vanilla in something, it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> it's going to be pretty good no matter what. You don't burn it, it's going to be pretty good. So, Could you talk about what you're doing with the Union of Concerned Scientists and the policy issues? Um, uh, so I'm a fellow at Union of Concerned Scientists. I was brought on to work with my friend Ricardo Salvador, um, who runs the food and environment um, section of UCS. And uh, we're working with some, we're doing a couple of things. We're working on a campaign called Plate of the Union, which I, you know, I have to say um, <laughs> is, a, is a, it's not a failure. I mean, I, I would, it's, but we're not, the goal is to get presidential candidates talking about food issues. We haven't succeeded. <laughs> um, but the goal is also, the longer term goal is to get people to push candidates on every level to deal with food issues, and I think that's a, that's a great goal. So we've been working on that. Um, you know, I would encourage all of you as election cycles come and go that you, <coughs> that you push your, you, when you get your candidates in a room, you say, what are you doing about marketing junk to kids? What do you want to do about school lunch? What do you want to do about antibiotics in the food supply and so on? Um, so that's one thing we're doing. And the other thing we're doing is we're working on a project with a bunch of young people that's called HEAL, and HEAL is Health, Environment, Agriculture, Labor, basically saying, you know, food needs to be fair and affordable and green and nutritious, and just trying to get that message across as many ways as possible. So we're working with labor groups, working with farmer groups, working with environmental groups, um, and so on. It's I good th work. I, th I think you're being a little unfair to the presidential candidates. I think I just heard Donald Trump say the other day that a former Miss Universe had a food issue. <laughs> no? Is that true? Is that Pretty true? Good, Rick. So a lot of people who like to bake often make their comfort food. What is your ultimate comfort food? Um, <coughs> I do so, you know, I should really learn how to not do what I'm doing now, which is to equivocate. I just don't do favorites that well. Um, my ultimate comfort food at 11 o'clock at night when I come off of an airplane and I haven't eaten all day is different from my ultimate comfort food on a Sunday afternoon when I'm lounging around and think, oh, I could cook for the next three hours and do whatever I want. So, um, uh, there's a cookie recipe in here that's a chocolate, uh, a chocolate almond cookie, flourless actually, gluten-free as it happens. <laughs> We're going to do a book called Accidentally Gluten-Free, <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally Vegan. Um, the rice I've noodle. been making those a lot because I really like to eat them. I mean, that, you know, often you make cookies to give them out or because people are coming over, but it's like, I want to eat those. But you know, I, I make, if it's a Sunday, after, I do, I bake bread every day. Every time I'm home for 24 hours, I bake bread. So. <coughs> that would probably be the routine that makes me feel comfortable. Um, but I, you know, if I have a Sunday afternoon and I have the right ingredients, I'll make a cassoulet or, um, uh, and I make, when it's, when I want something fast, I make like the super simple pasta dishes and that usually makes me feel really, like tonight I wish I could go cook somewhere and make myself pasta, but it's not happening. Well, you, 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 you yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you have. Cook for you, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. Come on, we got a kitchen. The, um, yeah, you did have a nice piece, a column once, years ago, I forget which, which one it was, but you said you were kind of getting fed up with, with uh, fine dining, and you had discovered a little Japanese restaurant out the back door of your right, former and people, building. <coughs> that was your comfort food to hit that. People, one of my, I sent one of my neighbors there, and she said, that place is terrible. Oh, now? No, what? then. That, that. <laughs> she said, well, I don't even know what you're thinking. That place is no good at all. I said, I, I really like it. You, and, um, you said you had taken a lot of friends there who enjoyed it. Yeah, and I, now I, um, 
Um, I'm living in the near the town of Cold Spring, which is up the Hudson, and there's a frankly pretty bad Italian restaurant down the road, old fashioned Westchester, it's actually Putnam County, but old fashioned Westchester Italian restaurant, and I love going there. The people are really nice, the food's okay, it's not expensive, it's like familiar, it's comfortable, and then I go to like a fancy place and I just get annoyed. I'm like sitting there thinking it's $17 for a glass of wine, and it's uh, $14 for this pile of lettuce with some lou lousy olive oil on it. And let's take it from there. Or 17 courses yeah, for the tasting menu. I don't have the patience for, patience for that. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm an antiquarian bookseller here in Philly. Awesome. <laughs> and I'm wondering, what are the cookbooks, classic or current, that you love or that have influenced you throughout your career? Well, Besides your own, which we love. Um, Besides your own. I was really... Uh, really influenced by Paula Peck, so I'm sure you've seen those books, Art of Good Cooking and Art of Good Baking. Um, maybe it's fine. The World War II era cookbooks, the, <coughs> the 30s and 40s, sort of big fat cookbooks called like the Victory Cookbook or the International Cookbook or whatever, where the recipes are all like tiny in little blocks. Um, and many of them are terrible. Many of them are really great also. And I love looking at those books. I mean, I, I like old cookbooks. They're fun. I don't really use cook. I mean, I wrote 24,000 recipes, evidently. <laughs> I, I don't really use cookbooks. Sometimes someone will do something in some part of the world that I don't know anything about. And I'll glance at the book and I'll think, yeah, the reason no one's written about this part of the world is because there's five good recipes in the whole country. And, <laughs> But they're really good. And they're good. in other books already. <laughs> um, but I mean, old, yeah, I think old cookbooks are fun. I, the, the, you know, I, when I started cooking, which was in the late 60s, early 70s, I cooked from the classic teachers of that time, Craig Claiborne, Julia Child, um, James Beard, Joy of Cooking, and the sort of outlier was Paula Peck, who was really, really a great, a home cook not a professional at all, a disciple of Jim Beard's and a terrific influence on me. Love, I'm sorry I never Why do you think so many people find baking bread intimidating? Well, I think a lot don't, haven't tried, so there's that. Um, I'm trying to remember why I wanted to start baking bread and, you know, I was doing recipes that were like, white bread in a loaf pan where you would scald the milk and melt a little butter and, and proof the yeast in the milk and da 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 the old fashioned. And the bread was not that great. Um, but you could prove something by doing it. And then um, I remember cooking onion rye bread because I wanted to cook the, learn how to cook the kind of bread I grew up eating. And I remember learning how to cook baguette. I think maybe People were discouraged because the results are not perfect at first, but um, this is something I've been saying about <coughs> cooking my whole life, and actually it's a good note to end on. When people are in intimidated by cooking, by baking, but by cooking in general, it's often because they think, for some weird reason, they think they should be good at it as soon as they start. And no one thinks that they're gonna be good at playing tennis or even driving a car, we all remember with horror being teenagers. Um, <clears throat> and yet we practice at those things until we become good at them or we don't do them at all. So <clears throat> I, you know, I think cooking is easily approached. I think you have to be patient. I think you have to be tolerant of your own mistakes and the fact that things are not gonna be perfect at first. But I, I've all, obviously for me, it's had many rewards, but I still am thrilled by, I make a bread it's never what I think it ought to be, and I'm always thrilled by the whole process, and it comes out of the oven, and I just think, this is awesome. Look at this bread I just made. So <laughs> I think people are missing out who don't do that. Let's thank, thank Mark Bittman.